Greetings. Welcome. How are you? It is Eric Erickson here and the Eric Erickson Show across the nation. Delighted, absolutely staggeringly delighted to have you. All of you should know, particularly those of you on WOKV and WDBO down in Florida, I have reached out to Governor DeSantis' office to see about getting him on the program here in the next few weeks. Um, not to talk about 2024 stuff. You know, one of my frustrations on all this DeSantis stuff right now is everybody is is focusing on him, the left vilifying him. Uh, and the man's running for re-election. For, he's not running for president of the United States. He's running for governor, re-election governor of the state of Florida. There's a lot about Florida that has a national impact and We should do justice to covering the issues in Florida uh, for our Florida audience, uh, but relate them to the rest of you because there's so much out there, particularly down in Florida, given the environmental situation there and the economic situation. How do you balance the explosive growth and the economy with a lot of legit environmental concerns down there with the Everglades, the the rise of the pythons, uh, Miami sinking? Uh, Whether you believe the oceans are rising or not, it's objectively true. Miami literally is sinking. Um, and how do you balance all this stuff out? And I just, I, I'm, I'm intrigued, like to have him on. So I have asked now, I don't want to talk about that right now, though. I would like to talk about something else. Um, I need you to understand this story. I need you to like, get it into your bones The Democrats have a new fear. No, no. It is not the fear that Republicans are going to get your period trackers on your cell phones. It it is not. By the way, did you know that's a like real fear now? They're like, oh, my gosh, we have period trackers on our phone. For those of you who don't know, we're not talking punctuation. It's not Grammarly. It's for women's menstrual cycles, and uh, they're they're not an accurate but fairly accurate predictor of when a woman may be in her period. You, the iPhone has it built in, and now women are like, "Oh my gosh, they might be able to get this and know I could be pregnant and and not let me have an abortion." I mean, the the fear out here, the 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 craziness and and the the nightmare scenarios of these people on the left right now. It, it's kind of kind of just unhinged. They're really scared about this stuff. There's a there's a tech podcast uh, that I listen to, and and the guy who is who runs it actually very nice guy. Um, don't really know him well. We've changed exchanged notes over time, but I mean, I just I think the world of the guy, and I don't know that he realizes I appreciate him as much as as I do. Uh, his name's John Gruber. He runs a website I've read for years, Daring Fireball. He was actually one of the inspirations for me. I, I don't know if he would be blamed for it, but he, one of the inspirations for me, jumping ship on on a legal career and everything and, and becoming a full-time blogger and then doing what I've done. He's just – he's a very fascinating person, I, I and he, he's as much to the left as I am to the right, uh, if not more so. Um, but he actually did a very good write-up the other day for people who are concerned about this issue – on privacy on your phones and how you can get your iPhone, for example, to turn off Face ID. So, for example, do you know John Eastman, the president's lawyer? The um, the FBI stopped him at dinner, made him put his hands over his head. They pulled his iPhone out. And they were able to use Face ID and, and unlock his phone and get his emails. It had John Eastman known how to very quickly, like surreptitiously, click the right two buttons. Basically, if you grab the if you've got an iPhone and you press in the buttons on the left and right together at the same time, it shuts off touch ID and photo ID or face ID immediately. Uh, so you can even if you're reaching into your pocket to pull your phone out, do it and it, it you have to do the passcode. And according to the government and the Supreme Court, uh, your biometrics are publicly available. So the police can put your finger on your phone to unlock it, and the police can hold it up to your face and, and get you to look at it and unlock it, but they can't force you to put in the numbers because that would be against the Fifth Amendment. I find it all deeply fascinating. But nonetheless, so he did a very good job on this, um, covering that privacy issue. Daringfireball.net is his website if you want to go find it. Whether you're concerned about period trackers or not, it's actually, if as from a civil, civil liberty standpoint, you should be paying attention to the privacy aspects of unlocking and locking your phones. In any event, 
the, yes, the left is deeply concerned about uh, the government now tapping into their peer retrackers, but they have something they fear even more. No, no, they're, they're not as scared even of ultra MAGA as they are this. There's, there's actually something the Democrats are deeply scared of right now, and the media is reflecting that fear. Have you any idea? Republican Latinas. Republican Latinas. Let me read you the headline and subtitle at the New York Times. The Rise of the Far Right Latina. Representative Myra Flores is one of three Republican Latinas vying to transform South Texas politics by shunning moderates and often embracing the extreme. Now, I just wait, wait just one moment here. Trying to transform South Texas politics by shunning moderates. Literally, the New York Times is on record on its editorial page defending progressives, ignoring moderates. Literally, the New York Times editorial page has taken the position that the progressives should dominate and the moderates come on board. And now they're running news articles saying, oh, I can't believe these Republican Latinas. At least they're not calling her Latinx. Latinx, uh. Uh, shunning moderates, Jennifer Medina, who also on Twitter wanted you to know that Myra Flores ignored talking about January 6th in favor of talking about grocery store bills and gas prices. Literally, that that's one of her this woman's complaints. The reporter, the reporter, one of one of her notable moments. Let me read you this. <laughs> For years, Texas Republicans tried to win the Hispanic vote using a Bush-era brand of compassionate conservatism. The idea was that a moderate's touch and a softer rhetoric on immigration were key to making inroads with Hispanic voters, particularly in Democratic strongholds along the southern border. Such was the Texas of old. The unsuccessful Texas. I'm just adding that here. The Trump age has given rise to a new brand of Texas Republicans, one of which is already walking the halls of Congress. The far-right Latina. Representative Myra Flores became the first Republican to represent the Rio Grande Valley in more than a century after she won a special election last month and flipped the congressional seat from blue to red. She became the first Latina Republican ever sent by Texas to Congress. Her abbreviated term lasts only through the end of the year, and she is seen as a long shot to win re-election to a full one in a new district redistricted to be much more Democrat. But what is most striking is that Ms. Flores won by shunning moderates, embracing the far right, and wearing her support of Donald J. Trump on her sleeve more Marjorie Taylor Greene than Kay Bailey Hutchinson. Her campaign slogan, God, Family, Country, was meant to appeal to what she calls the traditional values of her majority Hispanic district in the border city of Brownsville. She called for President Biden's impeachment. She tweeted QAnon hashtags, and she called the Democratic Party the greatest threat America faces. In an interview in her still barren office, the day after her swearing-in ceremony, Ms. Flores, not Congresswoman, no, no, not Congresswoman, they call her, Ms. Flores was asked whether she considered Mr. Biden the legitimately elected president. He's the worst president of the United States, she said. When asked three more times whether he had been legitimately elected, she repeated the same non-answer, that he's the worst president of the United States, which means she believes he's the president. Now, here's here, here's this. Here's this. Two other Latina Republicans, Monica De La Cruz and McAllen and Cassie Garcia and Laredo are also on the ballot in congressional races along the Mexican border. All three GOP officials have taken to calling them a triple threat, share right wing views on immigration, the 2020 election and abortion, among other issues. 
They share the same advisors, have held campaign rallies and fundraisers together, and have knocked on doors side by side. They accuse the Democratic Party of taking Hispanic voters for granted and view themselves, as do their supporters, as the embodiment of the American dream. Ms. Flores often speaks of working alongside her parents in cotton fields. How could she do that? She's not. Well, you know what the implication of that line is from the New York Times. She's Hispanic. She didn't work in cotton fields. You knew that's what the New York Times is trying to draw out of this. Ms. Flores, Ms. De La Cruz, and Ms. Garcia grew up in the Rio Grande Valley, a working class. You know, at the New York Times, I'm sorry. I apologize. This is the New York Times. It's not the Rio Grande Valley. It's the Rio Grande Valley, a working class four-county region at the southernmost tip of Texas, just the tip, where Hispanics make up 93% of the population. All three are bilingual. Ms. Flores was born in Tamalupas, Tamalipas, Mexico. The other two in South Texas, an area I can pronounce. Only Ms. De La Cruz has been endorsed by Mr. Trump. Yet they all remain outspoken advocates of him, of his movement, and his tough talk on the border. Now, this is where it gets damning, people. The Rio Grande Valley, as the New York Times would call the Latinx community there, has long been a politically liberal but culturally conservative place. Church pews are packed on Sundays. American flags wave from their poles on front lawns, and law enforcement is revered. Ms. Flores' husband is a Border Patrol agent, a note she emphasizes on the campaign trail frequently. In 2020, the Valley's conservative culture started to exert a greater influence on the politics. Mr. Trump flipped rural Zapata County and narrowed the Democratic margin of victory in the four Valley counties and in border towns. Now, this actually goes on quite a bit further, believe it or not. But I'm just going to stop there. They are, they are furious. The Democrats are livid. The New York Times is in a meltdown. These people go to church. They go to church, y'all. They have American flags on their lawn, not Mexican flags. Remember in California, there was the drive to take down American flags in predominantly Hispanic neighborhood schools because they didn't want to offend the Mexican immigrant families. And these people have American flags on their lawn. What is wrong with them? They go to church. I have said for a very long while, Well, first of all, let me go back. What do I tell you? I always tell candidates when I used to be a political consultant, I would run candidates for office very successfully, I might add. I would tell them, know when you're in the minority, even when you think you're right. Know when you're in the minority, even when you think you're right. I know I am in the minority. I still think I'm right. I want limited government, small government As a conservative, I want a government so small I could drown it in the bathtub if I needed to. I want a teeny tiny government where we rely on our communities, our neighbors, our friends, our family to get most things done and the government stays out of the way. I want a small government, fiscally conservative and socially conservative. And I know I'm in the minority. But what the Democrats don't realize is they're in the minority too. There's also not a demand in this country for a hyper-liberal government that is a massive spender, massive socioeconomic force that is hyper-partisan, progressive culturally. There's not that either. That's what the left wants. There is what Donald Trump found, the sweet spot in American politics. Fiscally, pretty liberal, big spending Republicans, but pretty conservative culturally and socially. A cultural, social, conservative party that is actually not opposed to spending money is the sweet spot of American politics. And that's what Trumpism found and tested and tried and found to be true. And it's drawing a lot of Hispanic voters who are fiscally liberal, socially conservative into a new GOP. 
the glory days of small government conservatism probably on the back burner right now as the GOP becomes, well, more like America, socially conservative, but willing to spend money in government. And I don't know that that's actually a bad thing right now. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number, should you wish to be a part of the program, 877-973-7425. They are trying to make Gavin Newsom a thing in the press to combat Ron DeSantis. Gavin Newsom, I actually increasingly believe Gavin Newsom is going to be the Democrats' nominee in 2024. Because, I mean, he looks like central casting politician. He's from California. He's a bit vapid. And I think they like him. I think they want him to be the nominee. I really do. I I, I, I firmly believe that. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to see the Democrats toss Biden. They're not going to embrace Kamala. And they're going to go with Newsom. He is running advertisements in Florida, particularly the Miami area. He's running campaign ads. That's right. The governor of California is running campaign ads in Florida, which is a tactic that, for example, Rick Perry years ago did in Texas. He ran ads in California. And now Newsom is doing it in Florida, basically telling Floridians, if you want liberal values and sunshine, come to California. Uh, many of the people in Florida, they fled California and its taxes, among other things, and they're not going to go back. By the way, Gavin Newsom is on vacation in Montana. I wonder if he's hanging out with my producer who is also in Montana. I could just imagine my producer hanging out with Gavin Newsom. Take that dude hunting. Uh, Newsom would pass out. Number one, he couldn't handle his liquor like my producer can <laughs> But couldn't hunt either. Charlie starts field dressing a bear and watch Newsom throw up and pass out. I mean, we should try to make this happen. <laughs> but yet, yeah, so Newsom's on vacation in Montana, which is interesting because Gavin Newsom refuses to allow California tax dollars to be spent on travel to Montana. So Newsom is willing to vacation where he's not willing to send California employees, a state that also has an abortion ban in place now. But he's willing to vacation there. He's a hypocrite. And I would love to see a Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott versus Gavin Newsom, Pete Buttigieg ticket. <laughs> now, you know what else I would love to see? Is you going to OmahaStakes.com and putting Eric in the search bar, E-R-I-C-K, because you will see the All-American Assortment. Listen, it is summer grilling season, y'all. You need to stock up your freezer. Who knows what the supply chain is going to do? But if you go to Omaha Steaks, you're going to get uh, double-trimmed, butcher-cut filet mignons. Now, what does that mean? It's it's not a fancy thing. It's it's actually, just understand it, it is butchers who hand-cut and trim up the filet mignons to make them perfect. So you don't have all that that super thick, fatty rim on the side. They trim it all. They do double-trimming so you get the perfect cut of filet mignon from Omaha Steaks. You don't get that from your grocery store. No, you don't, but you do from Omaha Steaks. You're also going to get pork chops, chicken breast, gourmet jumbo franks, potatoes au gratin, and for free, eight Omaha Steak burgers. Really good value. You're going to save over 50%. Stock up the freezer for summer grilling. Go to omahasteaks.com. Put Eric in the search bar. Remember, you get 100% satisfaction guarantee from Omaha Steaks. They've been doing this since 1917. They know how to cut up a steak. They know how to get it to you. They know how to deliver great quality at a great value, great price. OmahaSteaks.com. You put Eric, E-R-I-C-K, in the search bar and get the All-American Assortment from Omaha Steaks. Hello. It is Eric Erickson. I am delighted to be with you. The phone number is 877-973-7425. If you would like to be on this here program, I am going to go back to the phones. Juan, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. How about yourself? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Staying hot. But anyway. Oh, yeah, um, man, is it? <laughs> yeah, I uh, wanted first time calling in. I wanted to comment on a comment you made yesterday during your commentary concerning the uh, shooting that happened in Illinois yeah. and the fact that you made a comparison 
um, which I agree 100% with what you said, but I was just trying to get your take on why is it that um, as a black man myself, um, why is it the emphasis is, is only, it seems like it's always put on certain situations, um, like, like kind of like you alluded to, like the shootings in Chicago that go on weekly and the carnage that happens there doesn't get nearly the attention like we know what happened. And I'm empathizing on both sides of the coin here and not just trying to say that, you know, um, we should only focus just on black deaths. Um, but no, no, I, so I'm here's the thing, one, to get an that, yeah. I, I, I have, I have spent, I mean, I've spent time at CNN and I've spent time at Fox and Fox to some degree covers it. Not as much. When I was at CNN, I raised this issue and literally the people reacted as if I had just come from a Klan meeting. And I was informed that this is an issue for the black community to address. It is not for me as a white conservative to talk about the violence on the south side of Chicago. And I was floored by that response from people that this is happening constantly uh, and that somehow I am precluded from pointing it out or talking about it without being presumed to be a racist when actually there are a whole lot of people on the south side of Chicago, including kids, who are violently gunned down on a nightly basis, and the media just does not make eye contact with the story, and the, the local politicians don't make eye contact with the story. It's like it, it's the cost of doing business in Chicago, and that should not be. I agree 100% with that it's um, uh, by the way um that, so my my um deputy undersecretary producer shall we say just sent me this as we're talking <laughs> chicago had 971 shootings in the first five months of this year 971 shootings wow. in the first five months of this year and you don't hear about this story no and i was shocked too um that the governor actually was speaking yesterday it, it, as a black person Hold on, these dogs here. Uh, <laughs> as a black person, um, it kind of just kind of threw me for a loop because I was like, I don't re ever recall the governor of Illinois ever coming on TV saying anything about anything that was going on in Chicago. Right. If, if, if the, you know, and that that kind of just stuck with me. And again, you know, I agree 100 percent too with your point that you made yesterday. That at the core of all this is parenting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yeah. I, 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 I was just like kind of flow because there's some things I don't agree with you on. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, but that's fine. Yesterday, you you hit the yeah you hit the nail on the head yesterday, and I was like, man, I got to see if I can get in touch with him. Well, look, I, I, that, I'm glad yeah, you that, did. That's a hundred percent true. Yeah, and you're hundred percent. It truly is a frustration to me that uh, people are precluded from talking about this. And by the way, in, in Chicago is actually not as violent as New Orleans in my home state. Uh, New Orleans actually mm -hmm. has more nightly shootings and violence than Chicago, but there's a mm -hmm. bigger media presence focusing on Chicago, and yet they choose mm -hmm. not to cover it, and they certainly don't cover New Orleans, where there is mm -hmm. sy systemic corruption within the police department. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just, it, it's New Orleans is not a safe place at all, nor Baltimore for that matter. And we simply don't cover this as a society. And it really does make me wonder why. And, and I can't tell you the number of times I've been told this, this is an issue for the black community. Well, it should be an issue for all of us because it's Americans who are dying. I agree 100%. It just, yeah, it's frustrating. Day, yeah. It's America. It is. It well, is it's supposed to be America. Yep. But like you said, it just seems like one side of coin. From my perspective, it seems like it's, it's always one side of the coin or yep. not. It, yep. can't, it can't ever be straight down the middle. I agree. Well, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for calling in. Thank you very much for that. Great conversation. It's okay to disagree with me, too. Y'all should talk to my wife. <laughs> she doesn't listen to the show. Um, <laughs> secret to happy marriage in my household. My wife doesn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, let's go back to the phone. Shane, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Eric. Um, I was just trying to quietly read Twitter this morning, uh -oh. and I can't quietly read, read Twitter. You can't <laughs> quietly read Twitter. The demons are screaming at you from the tweets. <laughs> Correct. Uh, I was getting uh, some tweets on there. Like I was reading Stephen King, and there were some other celebrities that were posting on there about uh, our Florida governor. Uh, south of us, making 
making us or making teachers have to register as Republicans or Democrats. And I was like, that is not that absolutely positively cannot be a true statement. But yet it's out there and they're spreading this. That this is yeah, what the you, you would wants. think that uh, Twitter would give a fact check. So PolitiFact, a site I am no fan of, has thoroughly debunked this, it says it is flat out not true. Uh, it is a rumor that was st- started by a Democratic politician in Florida. It has taken on a, a life of its own from Democrats, and it is quite literally fake news. Uh, this is uh, from PolitiFact. According to uh, a, a post – an article at Salon.com that made its way to the Internet and to uh, Facebook. Governor Ron DeSantis, quote, just signed legislation requiring students, faculty, and staff at Florida's public universities and colleges to register their political views with the state. Uh, this is a liar, liar, pants on fire, false, according to PolitiFact. So they're just straight up just having to lie now. I mean, just straight out lie. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, flat out. Lion, and by the way, it's being circulated by a domestic security correspondent for USA Today. Josh Meyer uh, is circulating the story, and it simply isn't true. And they don't care that it's not true, just because they are happy to lie, and no Twitter will let them get away with it. Like, for example, so y'all know who Ellen Page is. Uh, there was that movie Juno, turned out to be like the anthem of the pro-life movement. Juno is a fantastically pro-life movie, so much so that Ellen Page came to regret having been in the movie and apologized for the untold damage she had done to the abortion cause by being in the movie. It's about a teenage girl who gets pregnant, heads off to Planned Parenthood to abort the baby, winds up keeping it, falling in love with the baby when she sees the ultrasound. Um, and Ellen Page has always had serious emotional mental baggage and has decided that she's now Elliot Page and is actually a man. And Twitter now will turn off your account if you refer to Ellen Page. And yesterday, uh, Ellen Page became a trending topic on Twitter and the trans community went nuts about it. Because Ellen Page doesn't exist, only Elliot does, and how dare they allow Ellen Page to be a trending account in violation of Twitter's rules. And it was all because uh, someone who works for Ben Shapiro got suspended from Twitter for reminding people that when Elliot Page had been Ellen Page, she was in a pro-life movie called Juno. And they suspended the account for referring to Ellen Page as Ellen Page because Ellen has legally changed her name to Elliot. And the crazy thing here is that uh, the Khamenei of Iran was calling for death for Israel, death for America on Twitter yesterday. And someone pointed out, you literally can call for death to Israel on Twitter and keep your account. But if you call Elliot Page by her former name, you get your account turned off. And then that person got their account turned off for calling Elliot Page a her instead of a he. Yeah, Twitter's got issues. Back to the phones we go. 877-973-7425. Bill, you're going to be up next. Welcome. How are you, Eric? Good. How about yourself? Good. All right. I forget what amendment it was, but the senators were, our founding fathers had the senators appointed by the states to represent the states and the interest of the states, not the people of the states. We have the representatives to do that. So how would it, I would like to see it go back and repeal the amendment that changed it from the senators being appointed by the states to represent the states and and back to that instead of having the people of the state elect them because what it does is make them another politician. If they're appointed by the states, their only goal and their only purpose is to represent the rights of the states and the interests of the states and let the representatives worry about the people. Yep. Yeah, okay. So thoughts? Bill, uh, when I was in law school, uh, Antonin Scalia came to pay a visit to the law school, gave a great talk on constitutional law and what originalism means and all of that. And he was asked by one of the professors, a liberal professor, uh, Justice Scalia, if you could make one change to the structure of American governance, what would it be? 
and Scalia said he would repeal the amendment that called for direct election of senators. What is it, the 17th Amendment? Uh, I forget which one's income tax, 17th or 18th, but what the 17th, I think it is, is, is direct election of senators. He would have repealed it. He said that the moment senators— um, so, uh, okay, yeah, 16 is income tax, 17 is senators. Yes, that's what it is. Um, so, yeah, he said he would repeal it, uh, and he would repeal it because it fundamentally altered uh, the representation the states are entitled to the federal government, and now we don't believe the states matter as much as the states actually do matter in our constitutional system. Now, the rebuttal right. there from some historians – is that if you go back in American history, now uh, it, part of it is a lot of the states had already moved to direct election for senators before the 17th Amendment, uh, but they were mostly um, in upper Midwest states that were uh, persuaded by the progressive movement in Wisconsin. It was the progressive movement out of Wisconsin that pushed the issue. But uh, southern states and coastal states maintained appointment. And one of the criticisms was state legislative elections became about – and gubernatorial elections became about the U.S. Senate, not about local issues. But I'm okay with that because you got to spend a lot more money, time, and energy trying to alter state dynamics in order to get direct election of senator or in order to get appointed senators – than, than directing them or electing them directly. I really think we as a nation screwed up when we went to direct election of senators because it suggested then the people mattered more than the people do. And I don't mean that negatively. I just mean the founders were deeply skeptical of direct democracy. They were even skeptical of representative democracy. And they created a essentially a House of Parliament with a uh, House of Commons and a Lords, except they called it House of Representatives and the Senate. And the Senate represented the um, representative of the states didn't represent the people, never was meant to represent the people, and to this day is not meant to represent the people. But because the people directly elect the senators, it concentrates power more there because it makes lobbyist money um, less spread out. You just go to Washington now. You don't have to go to the states. It was a bad idea. We should get rid of the 17th Amendment. Uh, you know what? They need? they need an Eden pure for constitutional mistakes. Eden Pure could take care of it. You know, right now, Eden Pure has sold so many of these to you guys, the Eden Pure Thunderstorm. They've decided to bring the BOGO back, the buy one, get one. Uh, celebrate the 4th of July this week, Independence Day. Get the BOGO from Eden Pure. You can clean up the smell of your cat litter box, cigarette, cigar odors, musty odors in your house. It eliminates odors. So here's what you do. You go to EdenPureDeals.com. And you put in the discount code Eric Bogo, E R I C K B O G O, and it's buy one, get one free. Now, here's the thing if you buy five Eden Pure Thunderstorms, you're going to get five Eden Pure Thunderstorms for free. You are. If you buy 20, you're going to get 20 for free. If you buy one, you're going to get one for free. It's the Eden Pure Bogo. You buy one, you get one for free. You buy five, you get five for free. It, the sale ends on July 10th. Uh, you guys have bought over 265,000 Eden Pure Thunderstorms, according to what Eden Pure tells me. And there are, you got tons of five star reviews. That makes for great gifts, too. Um, particularly if somebody in your house smokes or has a cat or some such, it eliminates odors. It also gets rid of the dust, mildew, the pollen. But I'm telling you, this sucker eliminates odors. So go to EdenPureDeals.com and use my discount code Eric Bogo, E R I C K B O G O. It's EdenPureDeals.com. The discount code is Eric Bogo. Shipping is free. Buy one Eden Pure Thunderstorm. Get the second one for free. This hour of the program brought to you by First Liberty. Building and loan wherever you are nationwide. They want to help your business grow. They can. Uh, where a lot of banks are saying no, they got more flexibility because they make their own lending decisions. But we're talking big deals, $750,000 or more. Uh, FirstLibertyGA.com, FirstLibertyGA.com. Reach out to them, tell them I sent you, um, and see if they can help you. FirstLibertyGA.com. Now, we must move on to other topics. There is some data out there. Uh, San Francisco Chronicle has this story. Do mask mandates work? Bay Area COVID data from June says no. 
In early June, during an uptick of COVID-19 cases, Alameda County was the only Bay Area County to bring back an indoor mask mandate. At the time, County Health Officer Nicholas Moss said putting our masks back on gives us the best opportunity to limit the impact of a prolonged wave in our communities. But regional case data provides no discernible evidence that the rule succeeded. The Alameda County seven-day average case rate for the past two months compared to rates in neighboring Contra Costa, Santa Clara, and San Francisco counties shows that there was no discernible difference despite similar vaccination rates and similar demographic data. The case rate curve for Alameda and Contra Costa counties are near identical. Because the neighboring counties are similar in so many respects, if masking policies had an impact on pandemic outcomes, one would expect to see discrepancy in the graph. San Francisco and Santa Clara had the highest case rates, higher than Alameda County, throughout the current surge, including pre-mask mandate. Once the mandate was introduced, the three counties all followed the same trend line, casting doubt on whether the mask mandate did anything to curb transmission. So here's the thing. Um, if there is universal mandatory at all times masking, there can be an impact. But if you're just going to like a local grocery store or you're going to an event, going to church and you got to put on a mask there and you don't have to anywhere else, literally has zero impact. I mean, I know there are places, for example, where I am in Georgia that still require masks. They literally are doing nothing to stop the spread of COVID. Because nowhere except these places require a mask. All they're doing is harming their own business, by and large. More and more people just refusing to shop or do business or or worship at these places where the masks still have to be worn because they don't have to wear them anywhere else. And now the data out of California, which has been the most compliant state with mask mandates, shows that the mask mandates aren't doing anything. If there's universal 24-7 compliance, it makes a difference. But there never has been universal 24-7 mask compliance in the country. And there sure as heck is not 24-7 universal mask mandate compliance now. And so the result is that your mask is kabuki theater designed to make some insecure person feel safe when the mask itself is doing nothing Nothing at this point. And overwhelmingly, over 90% of the people who wear an N95 mask don't even know how to fit it to their face to secure it. And so even the N95s aren't doing any good. It's all psychological for people who live by fear instead of by faith that at this point they're demanding masks when all the data now shows a mask mandate isn't doing any good because nobody's wearing masks except in those little places. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.